Oh, you are recording. Okay. All right. So, do we want to begin, Your Eminence, with a, with a prayer? He's frozen. We, we, we need to unmute, Your Eminence. I'm sorry. There we go. I think the king, oh, heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fills all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls for good one. Amen. 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 Well, I think prayers count even if you're muted, Your Eminence. So we appreciated a double prayer today. So that's a that's a that's that's a good beginning. That's a good beginning to the day. Um, hope uh, everybody had a restless night of sleep thinking about all the stuff that we started talking about yesterday. Uh, and, and I hope and pray that with God's grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit that we're going to have a very productive day today because Lord knows we need it. We got so much, uh, we got so much work to do here. Um, so I'm going to reshare the screen here. I'll, I'll uh, ask if uh, everybody could keep your screens live. I mean, unless you're doing something that you don't want us to see, but uh, that way we can we can uh, kind of keep track of faces and stuff like that. Um, uh, Philip, I'm going to ask, who was gracious enough to set everything up to kind of periodically monitor the chat room, and if there's something that you need to post that you need me to stop or or do something, then by all means, please put it in the chat room because I I'll be <clears throat> not monitoring it, and so Philip, you can interrupt me to do that. Um, as as I said today, we've got an enormous amount of work to do. But I want to keep us, you know, kind of focused in terms of where we're trying to go with all of this, and that is to create an extraordinary new vision for the diocese. Um, as blessed as the diocese has been, as much as it has accomplished, as much as you should all be grateful for the extraordinary things done both by the diocese and by all the parishes in the diocese, you know, you see the troubling trends, you see the troubling data, you know that there's work that we can and should be doing. And, and I applaud his eminence for show, having the, the vision and the, and the guts to, to go forward and to embrace this, because this is a, a really, uh, um, it's a good experience that will expose things about what's going on that, you know, you might not ordinarily want. And it takes, it's, honestly, it's a great sign of leadership when someone says, look, I want to do a deep dive into understanding what's going on and get a team together to work to, to make things better for everybody going forward. And so, um, uh, Your Eminence, I thank you again for your leadership in doing this and your, and your willingness to engage in this. Uh, as I mentioned before, everything you see here is, uh, is available for you on the website. And uh, after we finish today, you will have produced a lot of work. And um, certainly by sometime tomorrow, I'll have it all posted up on the website. And uh, Philip is recording these sessions. We're going to break it down into different segments with each break. And then as they get rendered, we'll put links up to the website so that, you know, if you had to step away, you can see it. Or if you want to refresh your memory, you can see it. Um, this is the aggressive, aggressive schedule that, that, that we set with His Eminence to try and get everything done that we can possibly get done today. As I said, normally what you see before you is two days worth of work in a live session. So this is going to be a testament to your stick to and your energy to try and get through everything that we want to accomplish. Uh, and secondly, it's going to regrettably um, re remove some of the opportunities that normally we would have for interaction. I much prefer there to be extraordinary amounts of interaction between you and, um, and, and therefore reaching a consensus in an effort to try and get as much done as we're going to try and get done in one day. We're, we're, we're not taking some shortcuts in the process, but we are taking some shortcuts in terms of um, allowing me to help advance the ball a little bit. So you're going to see me moving through stuff um, it, it relatively quicker and certainly quicker than I would have done if we were together. We'd be stopping along the way and I'll show you what it is. But what that means is I want you to feel comfortable pushing back. If there's some, if there's a shortcut that I took, if there's a summary that I made that you are uncomfortable with, that you don't think accurately really reflects it, then let's stop and let's have that dialogue. Let's have that discussion. And so either raise your hand. I think some of you know how to use the, uh, the hand raising uh, uh, capability within Zoom to, to let me know when you've got something to say or uh, post a, a message that, that Philip will be monitoring in the chat room and we'll stop right there and we'll take a discussion. So, and there'll be some points where I'm gonna open it up for discussion. Remember, you're gonna have to unmute to do that. 
So we're going to begin, uh, in, 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 in because of the timing of all of this, we're taking these things a little bit out of order, but it'll all work together. So we're going to begin with core values. And, and simply core values are, are beliefs that are shared amongst the stakeholders. They're really the, the bellwether beliefs that you have that you go back to when you try to decide and discern what it is you want to do. They actually drive an organization's culture and priorities because they should shape the decision making you do. And you should always be cognizant of your core values. One of the things that I encourage people that I take through strategic planning to do, churches particularly, is to take the core values, the mission, and the, the, the vision or the wildly important goals that we create, and the statement of why, those four elements, and repeat them on every document internally that you produce. So that going forward in your agendas for your, your diocese council meetings and the, going forward in your clergy meetings, those four elements are recreated right at the beginning of the document. And you spend a couple of minutes just going over those to remind yourself of that. They also provide a framework for decision making, and I, I always stop and tell this story. Um, most of you are familiar with the uh, the food chain Chick Fil A, uh, and in the interest of full and fair disclosure, one of my closest friends in Cubado is the president and CEO now. Believe it or not, they got an Orthodox guy running this uh, organization that was founded by a wonderful Baptist man. Um, Chick Fil A, being founded on Christian principles, has always held enormous emphasis on their core values. And uh, in my legal career, we were blessed to represent Chick-fil-A. And so it's kind of real fun to begin and end every business meeting with a prayer, which is something unusual. But they have very rigid, uh, not rigid, but very focused core values. And so one of the times they were considering a business opportunity uh, and they analyzed it using all the business metrics. You know, does it this? Will it make profitable? Is it that? And, and it passed all those hurdles. But being the core value driven company that they are, they then measured that business opportunity against their core values. And one of their core values is everything we do, we will give glory to God. Everything we do, we will give glory to God. And as they discussed it, they became concerned that this business opportunity might not always give glory to God. And they passed on what would have otherwise been a very profitable business opportunity because it was inconsistent with their core values. Now, at the end of the day, it didn't hurt them because they're still the most profitable and fastest growing uh, uh, quick service restaurant chain. And I, I think they serve great products, but of course I'm biased. Nevertheless, the point I'm making here is that even in institutions of, of business, uh, core values should be an integral part of it, just as they should be in your family and just as they should be in your church. So ultimately, what we try to get down to is one word or simple phrases, as few words as we possibly can, which means we're taking some shortcuts in the verbosity that we're usually used to defining things, but we're trying to get to some key core elements. The greatest basketball coach that, that ever lived was John Wooden. He coached UCLA to more championships. And one of the things that Coach Wooden always taught, and he was a core value-driven kind of guy, but, but one of the things that he always taught his players was that your reputation is what you're perceived to be. Your character is what you really are. And I think this is very important because what core values are is the definition of what you really are. And so it's not just how people perceive the diocese or perceive the parishes or perceive you as an Orthodox Christian, is are you actually practicing that which it takes and you know we you know we've all heard other people you know attributing the the great statement that you know if if being a christian you know were a crime i hope that i can that i can be found guilty uh and and so this is really kind of what a core value is all about now as i mentioned to you yesterday everything we're going to talk about every element of strategic planning has its root not in the teachings of Coach Wooden, not in the teachings of business schools, not in the teachings of commercial enterprises, but ultimately in scripture. And, and core values is perhaps one of the easiest examples to tie to a scriptural foundation. We don't have to go any further than, than the Ten Commandments to identify critical core values. And you could look at this and say it's without doubt that any Orthodox Christian would embrace these core values and would say that if indeed the actions I'm getting ready to take are inconsistent with these core values, then they're not what I should be doing. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ added a little bit to that in, in with some other clarifications about it. And so in the Beatitudes provides us additional reference points of core values. And so core values are critical, important drivers, and it's important to kind of start out saying kind of from a cultural perspective, you know, where are we and what do we want to be? Now, if you remember, I had you do a couple of exercises vis-a-vis -vis core values. So the first thing was in the homework that you had to do, that little form that you had to fill out. 
I, one of the things I asked you to do was to identify the core values that you thought should be the core values that drive the diocese of the Midwest. And then as a check and balance, we also included a similar exercise in the survey once we kind of narrowed the focus. Now on the website, you can actually download the entire list of core values. And I'm gonna stop this share for just a second, just to, to show you kind of what they look like when I, when I call it, when I use the phrase heat mapping as I'm going to use, um, I want you to, to see what we're talking about here, okay? So what should be on your screen right now, hopefully, are the core values on your screen? Nope, okay, so let's, this is what happens. Uh, right, let's stop that share, let's start over again. Okay, now this time it's gonna work, I'm confident, I hope. <laughs> now do you see core values on this? Okay, there you go, great. You gotta get it, I, when I have multiple screens up here, and so when I have it on the wrong screen and I do the share, you, you end up getting like my grocery shopping list. So what I did was I took the written homework assignments that you did and all of the core values that you identified, and I have a separate document that has every item, everything you listed. And then I said, let's try and find some natural groupings of these. How would we organize these in common themes? But to show you the, the integrity of the process, your exact wording is what follows the underlying phrase. So the underlying phrase is just my feeble attempt to take a series of concepts and see if I can group them together. And then the number at the beginning tells you the number of instances, the number of times that concept was referenced in by, by somebody. And, and so what the heat mapping process allows us to do is to take a look at relative prioritization of anything that we're studying. And then you see all the way down to the right-hand side of the screen where there are some one-offs, some a few things that were just, they were there, but and they're captured, but, but nobody else kind of said something. So as you can start to see, you start to see some trends develop in this. So these heat map documents, every one of them, are on, of, on your page on my website. So you can go ahead and take a look at it. And I know some of you had by, and I hope that after we're done here that, that you will all uh, take the opportunity to do that. So let me go back to, um, and cause you're gonna hear me refer to this periodically and particularly when we get into the discussion of the SWOT analysis, cause that's where I, I had to do a lot of heat mapping. So what I did next was I took the, the heat mapped core values and I just listed the heading, the name, the summary title of it, and then the number of instances in which it occurred. And what the exercise that we're going to have to do is to set the red line. So you see that right now I have arbitrarily set the red line at five instances or more. Now for the rest of this, you'll see that I try to be consistent and try to go with, if we got a third of the people responding, that's kind of where I've, I used as a starting point to set the red line. But you all collectively have the prerogative to move that red line up or to move that red line down. And so I'm gonna have to actually physically do that on the screen here, which is gonna, which is gonna be fun, but that's one of the things. So we can actually move that red line if you wanted to move it up to seven, or if you wanted to move it down to pick something up, we can do that. But remember, the idea that we're trying to reach here is that we've gotten it mentioned enough times, there are enough mentions that it actually meets the, the, the standard of being a uh, applicable core value. Now, one of the things that I did for you all, that those of you that remember the survey that you did, remember you did the homework, the written document, but I also sent out a survey monkey with three questions on it. And one of that was, I actually took all of the core values that kind of hit a, a certain number, and I asked you to re-rank them. And this is a, one of the validation tests that I sometimes do to see how consistent the group is in terms of validating it. Now, this is actually the chart. Don't bother reading it because I'm going to summarize this in just a second. This is actually the chart that's produced by SurveyMonkey that shows how each of the core value items were rated by you all when you were only given an opportunity to give me five. Um, and we, we may or may we may end up with more than five, but I, I use that as a as a tool to try and get you to focus on what do you think are the most important values. So this won't make any sense to you, but this is that same document put out with the words as opposed to just the bar chart. 
And again, you'll see the, the core value, the, I use the exact same wording that I did in the heat map court value from your homework. And then what you see is the percentage is the percentage of respondents that rated it as one of the top five. And then the parenthetical tells you the number of people that rated it as one of the top five, okay? So you can see, for example, that being Christ-centered was far and away the number one, almost, almost two thirds of you rated it as one of the top five core values. And then it went down. And you'll see I, I you know, arbitrarily cut the point at the 25% marker, even though usually I try to cut it at a 33% marker. And this will be the reason why. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare and contrast for you. And again, no, forgive me for moving through this quickly. If I'm, if I'm going too quickly, stop me and I'll go back and explain what I'm doing. But I'm doing this in an effort to try and move you through this process. Uh, normally, we'd be having more di engaged dialogue at this point. Well, here they are side by side. So what you see on the left is the way you rated them in the written homework. And then what you see on the right is when I forced you to pick the top five of all of them, this is the way you rated them. And just to make it easy for you, although this may not look like it's easier, I actually have a, a, a little line diagram here that shows you where they were on one versus the other. And this to me is a validation tool that's very interesting. What you'll see is the only one that made a leapfrog of epic proportions is Christ-centered. It went from only five mentions when you were writing it out in homework to once you were confronted, once you were all confronted with that concept to be your number one answer. But what is very telling to me, and if you were to take those two Christ-centered things off the chart, what you would see is there is an amazing level of consistency between the two, which tells me that we have really come through this dual review process. Normally, we'd have some discussion around this, and we're going to in just a second, to a really, really good um, consensus about at least what some of your core values are, because they're showing up no matter how I test you on it. Because remember, when you got the Survey Monkey test, you didn't have access to the the heat mapped document that showed how you rated them. So when we see that they are almost identical and frankly ranked identically, again, with the one exception of Christ centeredness, then that tells me that we've really done uh, a great job of capturing uh, your core values. And um, so one of the things about core values is that they are not ever listed necessarily in order of priority because a core value is a core value. You cannot say, I've kept eight of the Ten Commandments, and only two of them did I not keep. I'm set thumbs up, right? It's an all or nothing kind of proposition. So nobody gets hung up. Please nobody get hung up on the order in which they're listed. So what I have done in an effort to try and, again, move the process forward, and then we're going to open this up for discussion right now, is to take that exact same list. If you go back and look at this exact same list, you'll see them all listed here, and I have rejiggered the priority for no reason other than so that the line builds as you go from the lowest to the highest okay so the the shortest line is first and the longest line is last but it doesn't matter the order of priority these were the six elements that you came up with validated two different ways to try and identify as the core values of this diocese what you said is we are going to be christ-centered in our focus we're going to focus on being generous stewards. We're going to be welcoming and loving. We're going to recognize our duties of outreach and evangelism. Everything we do will be done with integrity, transparency, and accountability. And everything we do will be faithful to the orthodox and liturgical traditions. So the question I have for you, and now you can unmute and offer any thoughts that you have, is can you live with these six core values, or is there something else that you think we've missed, or some way we need to word this, or something else? His Eminence had a suggestion in the chat, Bill. Thank you. So. Why can't you put welcoming and loving and Christ-centered together in one, one line? You could. I mean, because welcoming and loving was on the top, and if you add Christ-centered to it, you've got a nice number one core value, and the other things still follow, you know. Oops. I'm going to do the, I'm going to go to editing mode here now so please forgive me. So so how would you do it your eminence? I would just add Christ centered to welcoming and loving 
welcoming and loving and Christ-centered. Okay. I don't know. I mean, that kind of, it seems to kind of summarize where we were at, and they're all consistent with each other, so. Okay. That's all. I don't, that's my only comment. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? Is this something that you all can live with? So, so does everybody know how to use the thumbs up feature on, on, uh, on maybe you just an activated. No, just one, one thing, one thing. Please, here, please. Um, faithful to Orthodox and liturgical tradition is last. <clears throat> that seems to me to need to climb up a little higher in the, in the, uh, uh, in the list, but I mean, that's just, yeah, so this is the reason why I wanted to make that point. Forget the order. They are not okay. listed in order of priority. Okay. all right, yeah, yeah. fine. And, and in fact, as you start to think about how you're going to present these, there are other ways you can present them so that that point is made more clear. But thank you for reminding that that's really important that you communicate this to everybody you communicate that – we don't, this isn't a, no offense, this is not a Chinese restaurant where we get to pick. <laughs> this is an all or nothing kind of deal. We're going all in on these values. Well, I think Father Andrew makes a good point. I know Archbishop Job of Blessed Memory, I think he told many priests when he ordained them, God did not call you to be successful, he called you to be faithful. Yep. That That's was, a and he told me on my day of my ordination is thank God you're a failure. That's what yeah. he said to me, and because God didn't call you to succeed, He called you to be faithful. So, isn't that isn't that an interesting way to put it, huh? That's yeah. fantastic. That's brilliant. But yeah, we're going to make the point over and over again. These are not in order of priority. They are not to be prioritized one versus the other. These are all or none, right? And so we we're going to and the way we present it can be done that a lot of different ways to do that. Okay, can everybody live with this list with these with this change? Can we live with it? I Thumbs up. I have one suggestion. Please. Um, uh, just, I mean, being very technical, uh, for the first one, let's just put it as being Christ-centered and welcoming, loving. That's fine. Yeah, I like that. That's fine, yeah. All righty, beautiful. All right. So can everybody live with this? Awesome. That's a lot of value. That's why I needed to see your screens here. So over there. So now if you need to, I mean, if, if you need to get up because you're sitting in your short pants or something like that, you can always, you can always blind your screen off for that one. But for the rest of the time, let's, let's see. All right. So normally this would take longer than it's taken you guys. But if you look at it, we're actually four minutes ahead. So we're going to make this up by getting behind someplace else, but that's okay. Um, I, the reason why we did it this way, and again, I apologize for not having more uh, dialogue. Normally, I'd have broken a small group out to look at the entire heat map list and then debate it, discuss it, and come back and present it, and then we have further discussion. So this, in an effort to kind of move this through the process, that's why we did the second validation, and the second validation validated the first work that was done. So I think you were able to do this. In a second, later on this afternoon, you're going to see some place where your second validation did not validate what you did the first time. So we're going to reserve some more time for some discussion there, which is fine. That's the, the purpose here is to have that discussion. Okay. So to try to make the segue over, one of the other things that we always like to talk about is a mission statement. Now, what a mission statement is real simple. It answers question number three. What do we do? And I know some of you are going, wait, 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 did I, did I miss questions one and two? No, we're going to get to questions one and two. We just had to rejigger the order over here based on the time slots that we had available. And they all have to be done. So whether they're done in a particular order or not is, is less important as long as the goal development, the vision and goal development is done at the end of this work that we're doing this morning. So what question number three is, what do we do? And this is all a mission statement does. In the business world, we use that to say, what business are we in, right? So it's essentially a clear description of the fundamental purpose for which an organization exists and what it actually does to achieve its vision. So it's tactical in its foundation and in its formation. Now, a mission statement, as I've said, all of these elements are, derive its origin 
not from business schools, not from Alice in Wonderland, not from other sources, but from Holy Scripture. And frankly, one need go no further than the Great Commission to understand that the mission statement that Christ gave to his apostles and to all of us as the heirs of those apostles is that we are called to be in the disciple-making business, if you will. Our business is to make disciples. And so there is a very clear definition of what it is that they are to do. Now, of course, in John 13, 34, the Lord describes what a disciple of Jesus Christ means. But the point that he makes here is this is what we're trying to do. Now, one of the exercises that we asked you to do is to sit there and say, okay, with that background, with that information in the early homework stage, I asked you to write mission statements. And, and again, normally in the, in the process, we'd have a separate group breaking apart and tearing apart all your types of stuff. But I, I then validated your mission statements by asking you to vote for the top five, okay? And so all of the mission statements that I just edited down were given to you in this survey, and you were asked to vote for the top five. Now, I'm presenting this chart not because you can read which one was which, but to show you something that is a little fascinating about your diocese. Uh, and and I, mean the, I mean everything I say in a positive way, but this is one area where y'all were a little unique. Usually when we go through this exercise, there is a little bit greater distance between the top five and the next group than there is in your category. In other words, there was a lot of, you know, people that were debating when I, when they did the top five, you know, and, and coming up with similar answers and whatnot. And so the, the slope is not as acute as I would normally expect to see. Now, if we had more time and there was more process involved, one of the things I would ask you to do is I take the top maybe eight of these and I'd ask you to only vote for three. And then you really would see a sharp sp spike in all likelihood. So what we're going to do is we're going to take these top five that clearly garnered a third or more of the votes. That was kind of the cutoff point we used. And here's the wording of those top five. And you don't have to spend a lot of time looking at this, although you're welcome to do so. This presentation is on your website. But this was the wording that was given to us by you all. And again, I, I took out the, the, you know, the mission of the diocese of the, the Midwest is two. I just put the, the, the action part. And you'll see that, you know, the first one got 10 votes, and that was slightly less than half. The next two got nine votes. That was 38%. And the next two literally just hit that 33% marker, okay? So then what I did, and again, normally I'd have a separate group doing this exercise, but I wanted to help you along in this process. I took these, all of these five concepts, and I said, what are the common words and phrases? Because as you'll see, there's a lot of repetition. You'll see loving appear in place. You'll see education appear in place. You'll see the gospel appear in several of these, right? So this is the summary of the key messages of each of these. Now, every one of the mission statements had multiple key messages. So I had to parse it and put it into multiple categories. So, it, and you can go back and trace this and you'll see the integrity to the process here, right? Took your mission statements, took out the, the, the articles and the other connecting words and just honed down to the key messages. And then what I said is, okay, so how many times can, can we distill this even further? Can we take this wonderful list? Because this is, you know, you, you all have seen mission statements that are paragraphs. And that's not a mission statement. No one is going to read that. No one's going to understand that. <laughs> so when I did the next round, I said, okay, what are the key elements of each of these comments that derive from all of them? And it, and it came down to this listing. And again, there's still a lot of words in, in this. So, I mean, every one of these steps is taking the exact words and just narrowing the focus down to words and re reducing the redundancies, okay? So if we stop on this one, what, what we can see here is um, good, prayerful worship, stewardship, and hope were concepts that kept refining themselves. Loving, welcoming, kind parishes that touch people's lives were also Compound, uh, concepts that were re reoccurring in multiple of these. And then living, teaching, and spreading the Orthodox Christian faith and Holy Gospel was kind of a third key message that kept being repeated in each of these, okay? So these are three, now there's still a lot of concepts com com uh, that, that's represented in these three combined ones. But I'm going to keep, 
I'm going to keep getting you focused, 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 and then we're going to come back to a decision. Now, one other thing I wanted to do. When I first started with his eminence on this, he said, well, let me share with you what the mission is that, that we've created previously. And here it is. It's uniting the faithful of the Diocese of the Midwest to discover, live, and share the life in Christ. And that is a very precise, succinct, well-worded, well-articulated mission statement. If we were going through a full-blown two-day process and this is what you came up with, I would let you go on to the next step because you have met all of the criteria of having a good mission statement. So I'm not telling you that anything you did in the past was bad, wrong, or, 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 or out of line. It's beautiful. What I'm going to ask you to do now is to consider, and it's just to consider, and then we're going to have discussion, the inclusion of these elements that you all came out with when I did not give you the luxury of going back to your state admission statement. In fact, one of the things his, his eminence and I kind of argued about was, do I give it to you in advance? I go, no, 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 I don't, wanna, I don't wanna cloud their judgments. I want them to be thinking freely when they go through this exercise, right? So this is the list, this is what you came up with. Now, what I chose to do, what I attempted to do, and this is just a feeble attempt by a simple country lawyer, was to take all of the great five that you came up with to distill it down to common elements, to break those common elements down into three categories, and then simplify those three categories into the fewest number of words that I could and append them to your existing mission statement. Because I think they give you a little bit more guidance if you want to. And this is what I came up with, but I don't get the credit. These are your words. All I did was edit them. So if you were to expand your existing mission statement, which is in the lighter uh, rust color, which is to unite the faithful of the Diocese of the Midwest to discover, live, and share the life in Christ, what you would add to it is the how you're going to do that through prayerful worship in loving and welcoming parishes that touch people's lives and spread the Orthodox faith. Those are the essential elements that came from the big five distilled down to the fewest number of words to do it. So this is what I'm presenting to you to consider and to wordsmith and debate and argue and uh, whatever else you want to do with this thing. His eminence is already, his uh, eminence is. This is a beautiful statement. My one question, and, and this is where there's the issue of the mission of the diocese. And then what is our task as a diocesan council? And, one of the things that's been a big value for me in our talks, and you've probably seen it, is I really believe the purpose of the diocesan council is specifically to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's what I see us wanting to do. That's what I want our council and myself to work on. Now, where that fits in this mission statement, I don't know, but I mean, that's always been an important value for me that that it's important that our, we have an active council that is using our resources, to, our resources to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Yes, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna come to that, your, your evidence, yeah. we're gonna include that in there. I think what we're trying to do now is to pro provide some more precise wording about the what. What is it? Because that is a wonderful, accurate statement. <clears throat> but now what we wanna do is get into the kind of the, what specifically do we do? And, and so this is intending to give us a little bit more guidance is that, that we're trying to, and if, I'm going to take your words and then I'm going to add these words. And again, I'm not hung up on any of them. This is going to come to whatever you all agree to. The key word in the first part of what you had, which was so powerful, was uniting the faithful. And, and that, is a, that is a really essential um, thought. If you just stop right there, if you were to look at nothing else but that, what you would say is the notion that we're here as a diocese now to help unite the faithful of our diocese is a critical what question that 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 we need to that we need to focus on. So I think that was actually brilliantly done. That's why I was so excited when I saw that. Now the what are we uniting them to do? Well, now we're going to add a little bit more clarity and say, well, we want them to discover, live, and share the life in Christ. And again, very well articulated. So I don't know how you guys came up with this one, but it is about as perfect as you could do it because what you said is we're uniting everybody to do three things. Discover for yourself, actually embrace that in your lifestyle, and then share with others a life in Christ. So that's why I think that is absolutely wonderful. 
if you were going to add anything, and then I'm going to shut up and start looking at the comments that we have here. Yeah. Um, what we would be doing is adding the how are we going to do this part into the mission statement. We don't have to. We could leave it where it was. But if you wanted to take the words that you did, you would add it in the following. Okay, so let's take a look at what we have. Philip, you want to give us what do you see in the comments there? Father Joel Weir suggested instead of share in a Christ-centered life, um, or he said instead of share the life in Christ, it, it could be share in a Christ-centered life. And two people, three people wrote that they agreed with that change, yeah. And that's fine, yeah. So we would, we would replace the parenthetic, we would replace the life in Christ in a Christ-centered life, right? Is yeah. that what the suggestion is? Okay. Yeah. And three or four people kind of echoed that and said they like that. Yeah, we got a lot of dittos in there, don't we? Good. Oh, except one oh, Bob, Bob different likes different. the original. Okay. okay. <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep we're gonna keep you hang on to that thought, Bob. We're gonna keep um playing with this thing until we can until we can reach a consensus, something we can live with. What do what do y'all think about adding the part that came from your from your discussions and your work before what are the pluses and minuses or do you want to just select select some of them or none of them or reword some of them or i think it identifies uh i don't know if you want to use the word direction or the process in a way the, our original statement was was nothing wrong with it but this one says how we would intend to do that in general how we intend to to unite the faithful and uh and to uh, accomplish the 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 original statement okay what else Bill, I have to wonder the utility of, there's a lot of great concepts in here, but you're really, there's a line through all of them, uniting the faithful to discover, live and share through worship in loving parishes, that touch and spread. Is that line um, a logical sort of uh, progression? Um, use some more words. Tell us what are you, you the way you the way when you end a question with the up tilt like that. One presumes that the answer you're suggesting is no, right? Or are you saying it is? I I, I don't know if it is or not. Okay. Um, it's just it's. I just want to look at it a little more, and sure. uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I mean, I, so the, the 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 point. Look, the point you're making is a great point, and that is that one should be able to follow this through a path, right? And, and whether this is the right way we're doing it or not, I mean, obviously that's, that's subject for your conversation and debate. Um, I don't think anybody would, would argue with the fact that, that, and you're gonna forgive me, there's the dogs barking in the background because someone's come to the front door. So um, we got some construction going on over here. So I apologize for all the noise in the background, but so the uniting of the faithful of the diocese to discover and share Christ-centered life is not something you were arguing about. I guess the question you're saying is, is it logical to say that, what, that when we unite the faithful to discover, live, and share a Christ-centered life, the way we do that is through prayerful worship in loving, welcoming parishes that touch people's lives and spread the Orthodox faith. Now, let me, let me tell you that when I was debating with myself this process, right, um, I, one of the things that I said you could do, in fact, I, I debated just ending it there. Because the idea is that if you have, you know, loving and welcoming parishes, by definition, again, this is me arguing with myself, so by all means, argue with me. <laughs> by definition, you, you would be saying, well, that by definition touches people's lives. What that may or may not do is the last concept, which is spread the Orthodox faith, right? So one of the other things that I did to play around, what I'm, I'm sorry, what I, what I was supposed to be doing here, forgive me, um, is what I, one of the other things that I did was say, okay, well, what if we did, oops, 
And again, like I said, this is all just me arguing with myself here. And so I said, does this more succinctly capture the same elements and the touching of people's lives while obviously is important is the byproduct of a loving and welcoming parish that spreads the Orthodox Christian faith. Or would it be bears witness to the Orthodox Christian faith? Okay. That's that, that absolutely. I like that. That's a little bit better articulation. I like that too. Yeah. All right. Father Philip, does this help you? Questions in the chat. I'm sorry. Yes. All right. So, so, so whoever it is that offered something in the chat, would you say it out loud for everybody so that that way we can all be looking at the screen and do it? Thank you for doing that, by the way. Okay. Uh, live in life is repeated and uh, welcoming and touching both are kind of overkill. So like if somebody welcomed me and touched me, I would be a little bit uh, uh, scared out the door maybe, uh, either to touch or welcome. Uh, and uh, so I would say to discover and share a Christ-centered life, welcoming all to worship in the Orthodox Christian faith. Just simply as simple as that. All right, so let's do another version here. And say again what you were saying. So, give me the edits. Live and life is repeated. So you don't want both live and life. Uh, welcoming and touching both together are kind of overkill you welcome or you touch well no and i've got that i've got that fixed right i, yeah, I deleted yeah. that stuff that dropped to the bottom has been deleted so look what's on the screen here and help me edit this please okay so to discover uh take out live to discover uh and uh, i would just say and no and to discover a to discover a Christ-centered life. So you're taking out the living and the uh, evangelization yeah. piece? No, taking out live and share. Take out live I know, I'm putting in parentheses. Yeah, okay. So, 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 but uh, that, was, that was the embracing and the evangelization piece. Yeah. Um, a lot of Christ-centered life through prayerful worship. And, uh, uh, and I would say to, uh, okay, so to welcome, I would say to, I would take the welcome up before prayerful, before prayerful, welcoming um, all to worship. Welcoming all to worship. Uh, in the Orthodox Christian faith, uh, and I, I, you know, if you're welcoming them, they're, they're bearing witness. It's dealt, is sort of overkill uh, to to welcome and witness. So, so, wait, so no, it's not. Well, well, hang on one second. Hang on one second. I want you to say your point. Hang on one second. Father, give me this change that you want to read here, and then let's debate it. So okay. how, would, how would we fix this? Welcoming all to worship in the Orthodox Christian faith. Now, bear, bearing witness, okay, so if we're going to bear witness, that needs to be like something, I think, that is separate because you, you if the worship itself bears witness, okay, that, that's that's part of the idea of worship, the bearing witness. But if you mean bearing witness as in like some sort of outward at outreach, then I could see adding it. But I would add it as like a second clause. You know, something about how we reach how how we reach out to witness, because, you know, uh, you, you think of Saint Stephen, for instance. How how does he how does he witness? He's he's worshiping, you know, he's worshiping the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, right? And uh, so, if if you want to see that as more liturgical, then you 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 say worship. If you want to see that as uh, more an, an external manifestation uh, outwardly to the, the rest of the community, then I would say witness there. But I, I think. Uh, in worship itself, worship itself is witness. I mean, that's that, that's why we open doors. That's why we have icons. You know, worship itself is witness. 
Now, somebody somebody had a, a counterpoint that they wanted to expand. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, three things. Um, yeah, first of all, uh, whose mission statement? And we have to keep in mind it's the diocese, which may be different from a parish mission statement or a personal mission statement. Um, second thing, share the life in Christ as it was originally worded uh, in the liturgy we have on uh, commend each other and uh, our life unto Christ. Uh, that's maybe a minor point, but finally, and I think we need this, I think these are good comments, but we need to be uh, careful that we don't end up with a camel that's a horse designed by a committee. Yeah, I myself like the wording of this statement only because it states what our mission is, but it states how we accomplish it in specific ways. So I prefer this wording still. Okay, Father Drew? I, I prefer this wording in red also because you can't just discover a Christ-centered life and then what do you do? You have sure. to discover it, you got to live it, and then you got to, you know, broadcast it, spread it discover me you know and then it, and then what do you do with that discovery <laughs> yeah and i think the the a, a lot of the points that y'all are making are great points and i just wanted to kind of um i think bob did a great job of reminding us that what we're doing here is trying to discern the diocese mission statement when you when you if you were to go through a strategic planning process for your parish and i heartily recommend you do that if you were going to go through strategic planning exercise in your parish, then you would obviously maybe do some things differently then, right? And I also, the other thing I want you to make sure that you understand is that, and this is where it's hard, folks. I'm not, I'm not, I'm acknowledging how difficult it is. When you say it's X and somebody else says it's Y and it's both X and Y, both of you are telling the truth. If you say it's only X and not Y, well then obviously you can't both reconcile, right? So it's okay to say, obviously I have to discover through liturgical practice. But the question then you have to ask yourself is, is that enough? Or is the part that says living and sharing is also a part of it? And if the answer to that is yes, it should be a part of that. It's not just enough, it is essential, it is no, no one argues it's not essential, but it may not be, it, you know, it's necessary, but not sufficient. So that's what makes this a little bit trickier. Okay, what other comments do y'all have? I think that some of the, the darker text part through prayerful worship, it's, it's beautiful, but it almost is part of a, a vision statement. You know, once we have the mission statement, how do you execute it then through a vision statement? So it seems like we're trying to combine two things here. And I think it's leading to some confusion. Yeah, I think that's that's a legitimate that's a legitimate point also. And I think that was where what struck me when I was looking at y'all's mission statements. Again, I, I didn't come up with any of this. I just summarized from what y'all were coming up with was that there was a lot of sentiment around maybe going one step further, Father Herman. And that's I think that's the question, right? Do we want to go that one step further? in the mission statement and say, yes, we're going to do this. We are going to, we're going to unite our people to discover live in the faith, but the way we're going to do it is, <clears throat> and so I think that's the question. That's a legitimate question. Okay. Thoughts, it just, comments? Yeah, I was gonna say, it just, it just seems to me like we're, we're developing, I know the diocese is a parish, in a, ecclesiastically in its sense, but we're, we're developing a, more of a parish, a parish mission statement instead of what does the diocese as an entity do to enable the, one, the parishes who are doing this kind of thing? Um, what do we do administratively to equip the saints, as, as, as Eminem said? Um, it, it doesn't really bear witness, I guess, to what we do as a diocese to make the parishes execute their mission. Yeah, and that's the reason why uh, you, you back when I was debating with myself, you know, I, I, I said, hey, you could actually do that. In other words, you could say that, that the mission of the diocese is to help create prayerful worship and loving, welcoming parishes. 
right? You know, and then obviously the parish and the people are is what's bearing witness to the Orthodox faith. And so that's what, like, I, like I said before, when I was debating with myself, I put a period there initially, but then I kept going back to your other words. And I, I think that, I think that, you know, I think you could, you could do that too. I think you could just, you know, leave the period there. I will take the, I don't know if it's the opposite view of Father Herman, but another way of looking at it. Okay. The, the fundamental unit or ecclesiastical unit of uh, church life is the diocese, not the national church, not the parish, but the diocese. And, and so um, the mission statement of like how to, how to organize our, our priorities in our life has to uh, fundamentally exist on the diocesan level. I would almost take out the word parishes from the statement because it's not necessarily the diocese is helping the parishes all do things, but that we as a diocese are all doing these things, uh, if that makes sense. All right. So let me, can I push back on you, Philip? Push back. Yep. All right. I would respectfully disagree with a small part of what you said, right? If the parishes cease to exist, there is no diocese. Would you need a diocese? And 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 so I think that the challenge here, when we look at it at the diocesan level, and and it's a, it's it, the point you make that is also valid is that as you get higher up, it's even more acutely cha a challenge, is to say. And and this is really the discussion that I'm hoping we were going to have. So I'm I'm thankful for you for bringing it up. Don't we exist as a diocese to help strengthen our parishes, not the other way around? Our dioceses don't exist to help strengthen. I mean, our parish don't exist to help strengthen the diocese. The diocese as a unit is there to help strengthen the parishes, do the hard work because they're the ones closest to the the parishioner, right. right? And I think that's really where the challenge comes in. And that's why I, I, I kind of stopped his eminence from where he was talking about equipping the saints, because this is the real challenge I want to get you to think about and debate during the day is if indeed our job as a diocese is to create the processes, the systems, the resources, the organization, the tools, whatever, right? To help the parishes then we, we will think one way. If we think it's the other way around, then we're going to think in an entirely different way. So Father Drew, you're going to say something? I was just going to comment on the, on, on uh, the stuff below welcoming parishes in the period, if we would keep that. It, it should read that bear witness, I'm pretty sure. Life bears witness. The, the... In, no, the parishes. In, 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 in loving and welcoming parishes that bear witness. Yeah, Is grammatically that, that would be correct. Yeah, grammatically oh. that would be correct. If, if we keep that in there, that we would make that. And, and, and thank you for pointing out that this is another opportunity. Um, as we refine this in this, you know, this, what would you call it, Bob, a camel making process or whatever. Um, uh, we're gonna get the grammar right, but we're gonna get the grammar right at the end. So we wanna make sure it's perfectly worded. The one thing I might add, and I don't know where this fits into this in, in light of what Philip said is, you know, the parish is only there because there's an antimension on the altar that says they can be this parish and it's got my signature. So there is something about the fact that the life of the parishes do flow from the hierarchy. Now, I don't know where that fits into a mission statement. I mean, that, that we still have a responsibility to equip our parish, to help our parishes in realizing their purpose and giving them support. But there is a sense that, that the, the diocese does, you know, it, it, in some ways, if there's no parishes, there's no diocese. But if there's no diocese, there's, there's no, if, you know, and it boils down to the bishop. If there's no bishop, there's no parishes. Right. And that's the beauty of the yeah. theological foundation of the Orthodox yeah. Church yeah. as in contrast to other 
churches, right? Where that, that is not a requirement. And you could, you know, tomorrow I can open up <laughs> the church of Bill out here at Lake Lanier, you know, and, and attach myself to nothing, right? Uh, and so what we have to be careful of here, and this is what this is really pointing out, is uh, a mission statement is not intended to always um, call out what is an ecclesiastical um, statement. Right. In other words, what we're trying to get down to now is tactics of, of a much higher theological understanding of things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so there are things that are, that are absolutely true and therefore should be absolutely obvious. The point we're talking about right now, for example, is, you know, without any parishes, there really isn't much of a diocese, but without a bishop, there aren't any parishes, right? So there's this symbiotic nature of, of that relationship. But if I were coming from the outside and I were asking, or even from the inside and saying, what does the diocese do, right? The diocese as an entity is not the bishop. The diocese is actually more than the bishop. It is, it exists because of the bishop, but if, if everything were just the bishop's responsibility, then all the rest of y'all have the rest of the day off. <laughs> and, and we would be putting too much burden on his eminence, right? So we create this institution, this diocese, and this institution has an organization called the Diocese Council. And that council together performs a series of activities and works to, as his eminence says, at the highest level, equip the saints, but on a tactical level, what is it that we're trying to get them to do? And so this is why we have to kind of balance. This is not just a theological expose. That's why theologians don't like strategic planning processes and strategic planners don't like theological processes. They, they speak in different linguistics. The well, one question that I wouldn't get, mind getting back to, Bill, is what Father Herman said. The brown, the brown lettering speaks to, at least what Father Herman was saying, the, the first part is a mission statement. The last part is kind of like a vision statement about how we accomplish it. Should that all be in one mission statement? Yeah. And I don't know. I don't have any thoughts on that. I just, it just, yeah. there is a sense that what I do like about this is we say, this is who we are and we accomplish who we are by what we do. And there is that, but does that belong in a mission statement? I, I don't know what you're Yeah, talking. so that's a great that's that's a that's a great question. I was actually hoping we were gonna get to later. So that's the reason why I was kind of I, I kind of dodged Father Herman's punch. Uh, but now I'm gonna stand now I'm gonna stand right in the line of the punch, okay? So um, if you were to look back at what we talked about the process was, and I'm gonna actually scroll back quite a few slides here just to do it. We're actually going to do something a little bit different than what you're typically used to seeing in a full-blown strategic planning process. If you look at item number five, normally we would take time to write a vision statement mm -hmm. from which we would derive the goals. Because we're using the four disciplines of execution as a process, we're actually going to reverse it. We're going to spend the time skipping the drafting of a vision statement and drill down to a few very manageable goals. And then hopefully at the end, come back and maybe fill in a vision statement if we choose to do it. So the way we're going to do this is actually kind of not skipping a step, but it's, it's kind of collapsing a step. And so your eminence, the reason why Father Herman was right and what he was saying is in a typical full-blown strategic planning process, in fact, if you go look at any of the other ones that I've done for uh, major churches or major metropolises and even some parishes, they've gone about crafting a vision statement, but they didn't use the 4DX process. What we're trying to do is get your diocese going in the process of planning using the four disciplines of execution to get some success in the next year or so doing this that will allow us to go forward. So to that point, that's the reason why you are correctly identifying that there is some sense of combining elements of, you know, a, a bit of a vision within the mission, right? Now, it, you can go either way on this one. It is okay to say that part of the mission is how are you going to do this discovery, live, and share Christ-centered life? Well, you're going to do it through, per, through these parishes. Let me just short circuit it. So, well, and I do like the statement. This, this kind of that bear witness parishes that bear. I, I, I do like this. I mean, I'm not. 
does it accurate is it accurate is it what we want is this reflect who we want to be you know May i suggest one little edit as far as to bring the bear witness part up to take bear witness and put it in place of live so uniting the faithful the diocese of the midwest to discover bear witness and share a christ-centered life through prayerful worship um you put it up here yeah put it in place of live bear witness and take live out and spell witness correctly huh <laughs> And then we don't need what um we, and then just just end it at parishes okay gotcha yeah that would do it i have a suggestion please um i prefer less verbiage so i may be the minority no you're right but you could say uniting the parishes of the diocese of the midwest to discover bear witness and share a christ-centered life because the faithful are in the parishes, the Christ-centered life is loving and welcoming. Just a suggestion. So let me make sure, let me capture your idea. So uniting the parishes of the Diocese of the Midwest to, now what are, are you doing with any of the rest of this, Ellen? Well, okay, discover, bear witness, and share a Christ-centered life, period. I got you. I hate to say I really like that because I, I think there was a little bit ago in the discussion there was a question about you know where the center is if it's in the parish of the diocese and I was thinking that it seems to me the point of the diocese is to ensure that the parishes are orthodox which is to say that they really are Christ-centered right so I like this that the purpose of the diocese the diocese mission statement is to unite the parishes in Christ-centeredness makes a lot of sense to me could we could we possibly add uniting and equipping the parishes of the diocese? I know that's more verbiage then, but I I think uh discover and to bear witness. I think we should just take out bear and discover. Just to witness and share a Christ-centered life. Because discuss, you know, witnessing has the potential to also encompass both, to encompass discovering, just, just to witness. If you say bear witness, then it becomes something different than just witnessing. But if you say witness, it, it covers both bear witness and discovering. So let's, let's take these kind of one at a time. Let's look at the first part. Do we want to say uniting and equipping? Yeah, I, 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 think, that, I think that would be good. Okay, so we got that. Um, now, now, the discussion is, now the discussion centers on just discover, I mean, taking out discover and bear and just leave it witness. I mean, taking out the bear part should be non-controversial. I mean, you know, when you say witness and bear witness, I mean, it's, they are really synonyms and one is fewer words. Um, but is discovery an important criteria in addition to witnessing? have to discover first no, you wait when you discover you're witnessing <laughs> otherwise you couldn't uh, discover if you didn't witness you couldn't discover <laughs> witness can play two ways you witness something and then you bear witness <laughs> yeah so i, th I think both. we allow it to you allow it to go both ways well but uh, i mean so it, if you just said uniting and equipping the parishes of the diocese of the Midwest to witness to and share a Christ-centered life. I think if, you can, but I think you can eliminate discovered uh, just by saying to witness. So witness to, 
to bear witness, to witness for the first time, which is discover, just to witness. Well, look at what's up on the screen here. So if it, it, I think what His Eminence was saying, it, Your Eminence, did this capture what you're saying? Yeah. But, well, that we don't have discover. We've taken the word bear out. I mean, to witness to, comma, and share a Christ-centered life. Um, my only concern is this, okay, well, what makes our diocese distinct? I mean, most, forgive me, but this, most Protestant parishes would agree with us. Yeah. So where, so, where is the aspect of the church? Where is the aspect of the Orthodox faith here? I mean, we do it according to a certain understanding of, of our tradition. So uh, I don't know if we need to kind of put something in there that we're doing it in the in, in, in the context of being faithful to our Orthodox Christian faith. I don't know how you write that, but that that's a piece that I think should be in there. I mean, I don't know. So let me let me use this, and thank you, Your Minister, for bringing this up. So we're going to have this conversation, or we're going to have this tension come up yeah. on a lot of things that we do. Yeah. Um, do not... So I'm going to separate what you're going to say because I captured that concept and put it down over here. Um, it is it is it is fundamentally not a priority to say in a mission statement how you're different. All the mission statement, all we're asking the mission statement to say is what do we do, and if what we do is the same as what other people do, that's fine. That's no, that, that, we're not. What I might add to Christ-centered life. I might add, in the fullness of the Orthodox Christian faith. Right, so that's the distinction I was going to make here. I mean, it's so so yeah. I, I want to relieve you all in everything we do of saying, well, everything we do has got to be different from the Protestants. No, it doesn't. I mean, if a mission statement is what a mission statement is, if a core values are core values and they happen to be the same, that's great. We have enough things that are different. We don't need to worry about that. Now, what you also pointed out, however, though, is that true to the mission of what we do, not because we're different in doing it, but because it's an essential ingredient is the witness of the Orthodox Christian faith, then it's appropriate to add something like that in there. Not just because it's distinctive, but because it's central to the mission of what we do. Well, that's right? fine. Yeah. I would want something like added out in the fullness of the Orthodox Christian faith. And if I could add to that, please, um, if you go back to slide 88, which are the original core values, uh, the first three, welcoming and loving outreach and evangelism and faithful to the Orthodox tradition. Uh, none of those um, uh, made the cut and yet Christ centered, which was at the bottom, but came up, but is there, which is fine. But uh, I'm just wondering if we cut this down too much. Yeah. So that's a great point. Let me just, let me address that. Um, at the end of the day, each of these do, each of these serve a different purpose. They all have to be consistent. In other words, we can't have inconsistencies between them, but they don't have to be redundant. So we don't have to have every element of the core values find its way to the mission statement, the why statement, et cetera, et cetera, right? But when we step back and look at it, and that's going to be one of the steps we do at the end, is are all of these, that's why, if you remember what I said before, I recommend that going forward, you have your on every diocese council agenda. You have your core values, you have your mission statement, you have your statement of why at a minimum, right? Uh, that, that are identified out there and make sure that those, those three pillars, and then if we have a vision statement, that'd be your fourth pillar, are there. Uh, but they don't all have to be redundant. Um, so don't, don't worry about that tension, but we do have to obviously make sure that they are consistent. I still would ask, Bill, that you add in the fullness of the Orthodox Christian faith. Yeah, I was waiting to get the wording on that. It's I've got it. I, in the fullness of the Orthodox. Yeah, that will be it. Yeah. Yeah, I was waiting for get the wording right. <laughs> and that's consistent with Ephesians. Christ is He who fills all in all. He is the Church. You know what's Ephesians one twenty two? The definition of the Church. It's, 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 it's Christ who fills all in all. I mean, I, I, I have a God, it's a memory, but that's coming right out of Ephesians. I mean. Yeah, it's kind of hard to argue with Ephesians, isn't it? <laughs> all right, what do y'all think about this? I, I, I think there was a, a good point about the loss of um, the 
and loss of love and welcome. <laughs> but I think you could put it all back in the Christ-centeredness. If you said life centered in the love of Christ and our neighbor in the fullness of the Orthodox Christian faith. Well, again, remember now at the parish level, there's unequivocally that that's true, right? But we're trying to define it up at the diocese level in the what we do category, back to Father Herman's good point of, of, you know, kind of what it is we're trying to do at the diocesan level there. Um, But at the the diocesan, we're not going to lose. Let me finish one thought. Excuse me. We're not going to lose every element of the, the core values. They are going to be found in commonality. But if you just repeat them all in every one of these statements, then you've, you've clouded the impact of the statement, right? And we're trying, to, we're trying to stay true to them. And we're going to use some common phrase. When we get to the statement of why, you're going to feel a lot of tension. Trust me. That's where you're really going to feel the tension. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think the, you know, these are core things our Lord tells us in the gospel. And uh, I think they are manifested on the diocesan level through, uh, you know, the way the diocese does charity, the way the diocese, um, you know, shows love of the neighbor when doing mission through the way that the diocese, let's say, engages. Yeah, yeah, no one's arguing that. Yeah, no one's arguing that one. I mean, no one's arguing that it's not essential, right? I think that's the the key point we want to make clear here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to call a pause here because we're 14 minutes over, as I suspected we would be. Um, and I wanted to give you at least, uh, um, you know, the, the opportunity to kind of, you know, move through kind of the next phase, if you will, in the process over here. Um, so I put it in red here, because we're, we're, we can come back to it. But as it stands right now, is this something generally that you all can live with? I like it. The way it is right now. Okay. Who is it? Uh, Philip, you're nodding your head no. It, I, I couldn't see with you. I, I, I personally, I disagree with the concept of the diocese as an entity that's external to the parishes. Oh, okay. To me, the diocese is the entire territory of the Midwest, the entire Orthodox faith across that land. And anywhere that you go, any parish that you go into, of course, they're going to have uniqueness, but you'll still experience the diocese there. Any charitable work that's done is not necessarily on the parish level. It might be between parishes. It might come down from the diocese or it might come from a parish. Uh, but uh, um, to me, uh, the statement saying that like the diocese affects the parishes by uniting and equipping them, it, to me, it's, uh, it's not how I look at it. Well, but I mean, what's wrong with the wording here is what I'm asking. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm trying I to avoid out, the theoretical conversation, but not I to take, say it's unimportant. I'm just saying, give me the practical. I would take out the word parishes and put back in the word faithful. I just w- wouldn't want the word parishes in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, what if we did both? I mean, I'm trying to give credence to the fact of something that I know you don't theologically embrace but but something that i'm suggesting to you that i hope you can get comfortable with um and and i'm i'm, I'm going to violate my own rule and take two seconds to do this um one of the bizarre parts of my career was i got started i got i was fortunate to start two state lotteries the state of georgia lottery and the state of north carolina lottery and we hired the best lottery executive to start the georgia lottery and she said to me at the very beginning was just me, her, and the board chair. She goes, who's our customer? And I said, the player. And she said, no. And I said, what do you mean, no? That the players are the ones that buy the tickets. She goes, our customer is the retailer. Our job is to make sure that the retailers, the people that sell those tickets, have everything they need so that they can more effectively meet the needs of the customer. Now, obviously, we have to produce products that the customers want to buy. But at the end of the day, we can't disregard the retailer. We have to work through the retailer. We have to support the retailer. We have to be there for the retailer, et cetera. Now, that's a commercial example. But I want to get you to think about this in the context of not ecclesiastically. I'm not arguing any of the ecclesiology here. That's, that's clear. That's very established. His eminence did a great job of describing it. But I want to try and get you all comfortable with the notion that when you put your diocese hat on, your job if I could say it that directly, <laughs> ought to be, how do I make our parishes stronger, better? 
How do I use the power of the diocese to harness all the resources to make all of our parishes better? Because think about it this way. Each of your parishes has strengths, but, 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 but Bob is only a member of one parish. If we can take Bob's skills and, and, and make him a member of all the parishes, <clears throat> Then, and I'm not speaking theologically, Philip. You got to get off the theological hat and let's go to the practical hat, brother. He's only waking up thinking he's a member of one parish. But I want to take Bob's skills and make it available to all. And that's something a diocese can do that is unique to a diocese, right? Because parishes left to their own devices, we wish they would share everything, but they don't always. Yes, Father Drew? <clears throat> I would just say that, uh, you know, with the exception of the bishop and his staff, all the faithful are in parishes. I don't think you need the word faithful. Uh, that's my opinion. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to put a parenthesis around that. And again, in the interest of time, we're going to move on. And we'll, we can come back to this one. Um, but before we do that, um, can I just have a show of hands of leaving aside whether we include the word faithful or not, how many of you can live with this statement as I, as, as raise your hand or let me, let me see some visual imagery of it here. Um, okay. That would be in our, in our word a consensus, even though it's not unanimous. So we'll, 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 but we're still going to put it in red and we're going to move on. All right. So let me kind of, let me segue over here because we're running a little bit late, but I'm, we're going to, we'll try and make up uh, some, some time on this one is kind of getting us focused back on the whole why statement thing here. Um, this is really the critical exercise. This is what I usually like to start with. Uh, and again, if we had a different time frame, we would have done this last night uh, is why do we exist? And it's an articulate, compelling and inspirational reason why our church exists in our case, it's why our diocese exists and why not anyone should care to want to join us. And it's real easy to get overly theological in this, but, but I want to get you kind of into a more practical mindset um, in, in, as we start to explore this. And if you, look at, if you look at the biblical foundation of this in Acts 14, 14, we see the admonition where we're constantly asked the question, why? Why are we doing what we're doing? Right? If the mission to statement describes what we do, the question we have to ask ourselves is why are we even doing it? I suggested that at the outset of the very beginning part of the program here is when I asked you to think about why are you here on this earth? Why have you been given the gifts that you've been given? Why are you doing what it is that you do? So the framework that we're gonna use is a guy by the name of Simon Sinek has really articulated this in the most succinct manner that I know. Uh, uh, there are others out there doing this. I, I do it my own way, but I, I like to use Simon's uh, a video over here. And so what we're going to do together, hopefully, is watch this short 18-minute uh, TED Talk. Uh, that is, I think, the second most viewed TED Talk of all TED Talks of all time. And I, and I will tell you in advance that um, while most of his examples, most of his examples are um, in the business world, there are some that are not. Every one of the principles that he's talking about in this context has absolute a, uh, application in the church environment, in the ministry environment, in the parish environment. And I will tell you, having gone through detailed, in-depth, uh, wide discovery processes with ministries as diverse as the Orthodox Christian prison ministry to churches, to dioceses, to parishes, to individual ministries, the wide discovery process can actually be a, a, a very valuable piece of that exercise. So if the testing that we did at the beginning works now, you're going to be able to see and hear and if you can't hear, start waving your hand so I can see it. If you can't see, start waving your hand so I can see it. We're going to watch this, uh, this uh, TED Talk together, okay? What do we do for a break? Is there a We're break? Gonna, right after this. Right okay. after this. All right. Right after this. <laughs> can everybody hear it okay? How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, 
Why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery, and this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products. 
and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brains, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do? Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that, you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you, um, Hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. And nowhere, nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the permu same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright Brothers team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with, for, with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts, because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, 
the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys, and I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first, he didn't get rich, he didn't get famous, so he quit. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touch-tone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on this scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap, that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, cl cl uh, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, or stood in, six, in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out about eight or nine years ago to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above six, except for a couple of little spikes. Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 
250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations, and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own and they told people. And some of those people um, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there were two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the Civil Rights Movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority, but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. So, I, you know, again, as I said, it's easy to get bogged down in the commercial example side of the exercise, but I, I want you to start to think about how this applies to every organization, every institution, every, everything you do. And that when you find people that believe what you believe and are devoted to what you believe, then you actually get people to make the kinds of decisions that you want them to make. And it's not because you're rational and you give them a good thought and a good explanation and a good process. And, it, and, it's, and we need look no further than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he called the disciples to follow him, he didn't give them the seven reasons why they should follow him and the six steps that they should take that's going to make their life better. He set out a target of the, just the core element of what he believed. And then he said this. Now, of course, he's the Lord. So that it's a little different, right? But at the same time, what we need to be cognizant of is that as a church institution, we have a unique opportunity to share what we believe. So here's, normally we would have done a little bit different, but because we're running a little bit line, we're going to do, we're going to call an audible here uh, so that we're going to try and, and try and pick it back up again. It is 1041 on your time frame and 1141 on my time frame. So I'm going to ask you to reconvene at 11 o'clock, reconvene at 11 o'clock central, okay? Take about a 20-minute break and refill your coffee cup, et cetera, et cetera, and then we're going to try and, and make up some of our time. Please keep your connections live. Philip's going to pause the recording, and we're going to start a new recording, but don't disengage. You're welcome to stop the video so we don't see you doing whatever it is that you're going to do in this intervening period of time. But please be, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the C, the phrase DIC, derriere in chair. So please be back DIC at 11 o'clock central. All right. Thank you all.